Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this thinking with David Baddiel, a discussion of his book, Jews Don't Count. Um, and I've read this book aware of the fact that I, as a journalist, um, sit next to a typewriter, the typewriter that my grandmother had, an Erica typewriter, uh, that uh, she had hoped to use as a journalist. She, um, uh, my family were Berlin Jews, left uh, in 36, and one of the first things that the Nazis had done was to bar Jews from working in the press, from bar Jews from being able to write what they think. And in reading this book, David, I couldn't help thinking about what a typewriter is for and the capacity to, uh, to write ideas that are as challenging and I should say as invigorating as this. So the first thing is to say thank you. It's a, it's a hell of a read. Um, the second thing is just to introduce you to a thinking. The, the idea when we set it up was to have, if you like, an open news meeting. So in the way in which you might come to a newsroom and talk about your ideas with a room of journalists, you might be able to do that with a room of everybody and people will share their points of view their, 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 and that we will have, I hope, a civilized forum for disagreement, um, but, you know, hear different Same. points of different points of view. Um, um, people do please weigh in on the chat. You know, you'll have uh, opinions about what David says. You, if you've read the book, you'll no doubt have opinions too about the book. For those people who haven't read it though, David, can we just start with you setting out the argument? Otherwise I'm gonna find myself trying to do that and it won't be nearly as good. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's quite a short book. So sometimes when I'm asked to set out the arguments, I just think I'll read the book in a slightly grouchy way. <laughs> uh, it won't take you that long. Um, and actually, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, it was originally commissioned by the Times Literary Supplement as an essay book. They wanted to revive this slightly, you know, Orwellian tradition of the essay book of books that are sort of part pamphlet, really, uh, about all sorts of subjects. And I think Lee Child, for example, has written one called The Hero, which is just a sort of musing on that subject. And they asked me and I said, I'd quite like to write one about this subject. And the subject is what I perceive to be the uh, pro the progressive neglect, if you, you would like, the absence of concern uh, in uh, progressive discourse about anti-Semitism. And the reason I call it an absence or a neglect is I want to make it clear that this is not a book about traditional, for want of a better word, anti-Semitism. It's not about Nazism or neo-Nazism. It's not really about people who hate Jews, although the beating drum of the fact that those people existed and very much still exist and in fact growing in number is sort of the background point of this book, which is that the growing in number and the continuing beating drum of proper uh, anti-traditional far-right murderous anti-Semitism is exactly the reason why progressives need to be less neglectful of this racism, which is what I feel they are. And obviously it has to be seen in the context of a very powerful intensification and often very positive intensification of you know, identity politics and of concern and of awareness from people who are not from those minorities, of those minorities and the offences against them. And by that, I don't just mean ethnic minorities, I'm including their uh, gender minorities and disabled people and all sorts. You know, there are many, many ways in which understanding and representation of and concern for minorities has been improved and enhanced over recent years. And I feel there are ways in which Jews have not kind of gone along with that and the way that progressives think about Jews has not gone along with that and there are a thousand reasons for that but I'm going to stop talking for a bit so because those things will come up. So there's an interesting thing firstly it's it is an argument with a certain group that was the thing that was really striking an argument with progressives but it was also as you say David an argument about the omission of outrage the the, the failure to condemn anti-semitism and I want to get to your argument with hierarchies of racism, but what do you think is at the root of that failure to condemn? Well, as I said, the reasons why I think there is a progressive, why that hierarchy of racism exists, uh, it's something which is kind of vaguely unmentionable, I think, in progressive circles, and I've just gone ahead and mentioned it, that there is, I think, a hierarchy of which racisms are most important. And the reason I think that anti-Semitism is low down on that has many reasons, but if I was going to boil it down to just a couple, the number one is that um, from, as it were, traditional anti-Semitism, there's a hangover. And that hangover is that Jews are 
seen not just as all minorities are as lowly and scheming and verminous and all the sort of things that all minorities have to suffer from they're also it's a double-pronged racism that involves them also being high status in a bad way i.e evil and control of the world rich privilege very importantly white for many people purely just a branch of whiteness being jewish uh, and th that puts them outside the sort of what I call the sacred circle of minorities who suffer discrimination that in a particular kind of Marxist study, you can't really suffer discrimination if you're privileged and powerful and all the rest of it. So that would be the primary reason for it. There are other very important reasons for it, the downgrading of anti-Semitism, which I see all the time from ethnic, from an ethnic thing to a religious thing, from racism to a religious thing. So people misunderstand mm. being Jewish <coughs> as a religious thing. And therefore, when I talk about racism, anti-Semitism being racism online, I often get from both right and left circles, this sense, so it's not racism, it's religious intolerance, you've made a mistake. And I always say, I'm an atheist, the Gestapo would shoot me tomorrow. Mm. Uh, and I've suffered many different types of anti-Semitism in my life. And I've never said, hold on, you don't understand, I don't keep kosher. That never works <laughs> with those people. And so th those are central. There's also obviously Israel becomes a massive deal with all this. Uh, so there are a thousand reasons, but those are the, those are the most I important. And, and I want to I want to come for can in a moment to some of those. You say Israel, and you talk about whiteness. But can I just pick up so first on this high low idea, David? This yeah. idea that that there's something specific about anti-Semitism because the Jews are both seen, as you say, in the gutter, but also you know manipulating and controlling the world. Mm -hmm. And and do you think that particularly amongst progressives, it's this strand of anti-Semitism, this belief that the Jews have the money, have the power, that explains a, a reluctance to weigh in on anti-Semitism as anti-Jewish racism in the way in which they weigh in on other forms of racism. Yeah, I think I think so. I mean, I think it's uh, complex and I think sometimes it's not straightforwardly conscious. I mean, an example that I use uh, in the book, which I have talked about before, and I should make it clear that the book talks about this as a long-standing malaise. It's not, it does talk a lot about the Corbyn Labour Party, but it goes back many years before that. Mm -hmm. And this happened in 2010, which was, I was at Chelsea, the football club I support, and Chelsea, the Chelsea fans behind me started chanting what I call the Y word. I deliberately call it the Y word because I'm aware that the word yid, which I'm going to use, is somehow not as bad as the P word or the N word, which are words that, that progressives would say, well, those are words that are unmentionable, but somehow the Y word is not. Anyway, this, uh, because I mean, I could go into the whole thing, but basically- well, go, go into the whole thing, tell, tell the story. Well, people don't know, it's an identity that Spurs fans use, that Spurs fans call themselves the Yids, even though most Spurs fans are not Jewish. So it's this very strange thing, which is a reclamation, which it isn't, of an identity that is not actually theirs. Most Spurs fans, despite what the myths are, are not Jewish, but it's associated with Jewishness uh, because of the area that it's from. That leads to the identity the Yids, the Yid army, and then it also leads to extreme anti-Semitism on the part of Chelsea fans and Arsenal fans and West Ham fans or whatever in saying, we hate the fucking Yids, we hate the blah, blah, blah. Anyway, me and my brother have put up with this for years and years and years. And then in 2010, we weren't even playing Spurs, just something about Spurs came up on the school line. They were losing, I think, to Hull. And the, the ch chant starts behind us we ex absorb it and feel sad about it and depressed about it and it just happens but then a bloke behind us about 10 seats behind us just starts going fuck the yids fuck the yids and then fuck the jews fuck the fucking jews over and over again now here's what you need to, to see this right he is a traditional anti-semite but the arena that we're in chelsea football club in 2010 is an arena in which it says in the program we have a zero tolerance culture here for racism anyone heard saying anything racist will be banned for life. It says that in the programme in 2010. And yet, a man is shouting, fuck the Jews, fuck the fucking Jews, and no one is doing anything. No steward is intervening, nothing is happening. And my brother, is a rather sort of heartbreaking story about my brother, Ivor, who is not hard, standing up and telling him to shut up, and the bloke saying, you know, you fucking shut up, and they're nearly a fight starting, and him eventually sitting down, and my brother sitting down and saying, I think I'm going to cry, which I've always found incredibly moving. But my point is that the, the reaction to it from stewards was completely nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. And then when we eventually decided, me and my brother, to do a film about it called The Y Word, there was massive resistance from it. 
it was very hard to get kick racing out of football behind it, who they did eventually get behind it, but only after Gary Lineker said he would appear in the film. And there was a general feeling of this is not as important. This is not as important as the very important, let me make that absolutely clear, the very important stuff they were doing, uh, trying to stop abuse of black players, and they had a campaign about homophobia and, and the terrorists about to start. I'm not denying the absolute importance of all of that, but I am noting that they felt this, isn't, this doesn't really matter. And it is a very extreme form of racism. So, so, so it's, very, it's very interesting what happens. And just continue with the story, David, because you then do get to make the, you do get to make the film, and then you have an encounter with David Cameron, then yeah. Prime Minister. So just talk us through that, because I think that's also interesting. OK, so when I say progressives, I, I mean quite a wide consensus. And I, in, my, in his own way, I would include David Cameron in that. So I'm not just talking about the left in any kind of straightforward way. There's no question that David Cameron is informed by progressive ideas and they definitely drive an agenda. You know, he started, it's, he, he's responsible for same sex marriage or whatever. So suddenly in the middle so one of the things about this our campaign which was not actually a straightforward like oh this should be banned i mean you know we were just trying to raise awareness of it there was an enormous resistance to it um and at one point i think the jewish chronicle who by the way were not that on side for we could talk about why that might be anyway but asked david cameron sort of doorstepped him or something at the end of a meeting what do you think and David Cameron, and I say, I don't like using this word because it's part of my project that people understand that the Y word should be as unmentionable as, as others, but this story is easier told if I do say the word. They said to David Cameron, what do you think? And he said, oh, I think it's fine for Spurs fans to call themselves Yids. Now, the first thing to note there is that this is a hate word for Jews. It was daubed across the East End by fascists, okay? Uh, it was, you know, it is used all the time. If you hear the word fucking Yid or whatever, you know what people are talking about. And there is no way that David Cameron would let that word pass his lips if it was any other hate word for a minority. But he didn't even think about it. Then, I mean, this is just a funny story in a way, but about a year later, I'm about to do The Agenda, which if anyone remembers was a sort of Question Time light programme on ITV, uh, hosted by Tom Bradby. And I did it a few times. And anyway, I'm on, I'm on this and David Cameron is on it. And we're waiting around in the green room. David Cameron appears in the green room and he ignores everyone and just comes over to me slightly flustered and says, because clearly he'd been briefed that I was there, are we going to talk about the Yid thing? And I said, I don't know, it's up to Tom. Right? He said, well, just so you know, I've spoken to Lord Feldman, one of his associates, and you're right. Lord Feldman says, Badil is right. So, when, you know, if the Yid thing comes up, you know, I'm just going to say you're right. And I wanted to say, yeah, but you're still saying the word, aren't you, David? You're still not stopping at any stage to think that's a Jewish person he might have an issue with me saying that word. It's just not occurring to you. And, and, and so, so the interesting thing is that the debate does move, right? But then what's interesting to me is that you, you, you set out in the book this argument that says, I'm having, a, I'm, I'm having an argument here with progressives, not just progressives of the left, but predominantly of the left. I'm having an argument because I see this pattern of high-low portrayal of anti-Jewish racism, anti-Semitism. And then you and then you make this argument about uh, with with the hierarchy of racisms, which brings us right into 2020, 2021. And I just want to read something that you write, because I have to say I stopped and I thought about it for a long time. And I'm not sure entirely what I think, David, because it, it seems so self-evidently true, but but it, it's complicated. You write, not all racisms are the same. Racism against people of color is different in kind to racism against Jews. The question in this book is why is a difference in why a difference in kind should equate to a difference in significance, yeah. and and central to your argument is that these are all racisms and they should all be equally significant. Well, I'm not saying exactly that. Uh, I, I I think all racism should be significant. Uh, I absolutely accept that within the ebb and flow of history, some racisms have to take predominance in for thinking people at certain times. So I certainly feel that during the Black Lives Matter uh, time, it was really right that everyone was focused on that. Uh, but what I think is that is it with if there is a hierarchy of racism, it, it becomes problematic if certain racisms are seen as not really a problem at all within that because of the predominance of others. Mm. I see. And so so how do you so how do you explain the response of people who are really passionately 
anti-racist, who define themselves as anti-racist, and their relative um, neglect of anti-Semitism, as you see it. I think part, part of it is, uh, you know, as I say, to do with these notions, these hangover notions about Jews, uh, that Jews are powerful and rich and privileged, so therefore kind of don't need it, is the sort of central thing. And that, like, you know, we only have a certain amount of concern that we can give, and these people are kind of okay. And there's a number of things wrong with that. I mean, there's a kind of mythical thing wrong with it, which is that the data does not show, actually, that Jews are that much more privileged. And also, it doesn't fit anyway with their attitude towards other minorities that they would deem worthy of protection. For example, I believe you know, Hindus are the most uh, economically successful uh, ethnic grouping in the world, but no one would say, therefore, you know, they don't need the protections of anti-racism. To use a different example, to go away from race for a minute, one of the things that people talk about with Jews as well is Jews have got this ability to pass. Uh, and so therefore they, they have sort of privilege because they can pass. And I think that's a very complicated- Sorry, just explain that. So just explain, pass mean, well, like pass no one noticed. Well, Jewish, I guess. Yeah. Pass is non-Jewish. And so, they, so their ethnicity is not immediately visible except at those times when fascist governments have made their ethnicity visible through yellow stars or whatever. But that's a very complicated thing to say, isn't it? I mean, I, I met this woman, I talk about this in the book at a party once, wedding party and she said oh I'm Jewish uh, and then she said all these anti-semitic things she said but people don't know because I had a nose job right and I went okay and then she said I never normally tell people I'm Jewish actually uh, and I said why not and she said well people don't like them and she said that in such a sort of straightforward shrugging way I thought okay this is very interesting that someone thinks well it's fine because I just won't tell people I'm Jewish and do you know what that makes Jews sort of like it makes Jews like gay men before sort of 1967. It's sort of like gay men in the closet. And no one would say, you know, uh, well, gay men have, don't suffer the, from the sort of economic structural oppression, perhaps, that some minorities do. And they, perhaps they have economic security. So homophobia doesn't matter. Who's mm -hmm. going to say that? Obviously, that's not correct. But this overweening, just let me finish, sorry, this one point, this overweening sense slightly racist, slightly mythical sense of the economic security of Jews does create the sense that they don't need to essentially be concerned with. And I guess my final point about that is, even if you buy the economic security of Jews, which as I say is problematic, my non-Marxist point is economic security does not in the end protect you from racism. My grandparents were rich. They lived in Königsberg in 1930s with a brick factory. They were rich. By 1939, all their family had been murdered and everything had been taken away. So this notion that it's okay because they have greater economic security than others, it, it isn't enough. It isn't enough and it doesn't mean that you are disserviced of the protections that the progressives should be giving to minorities. So I, I was really interested in that and I was really struck by that in the book, the, you know, this argument you know, that the, the indulgence of anti-Semitism is a reflection of this perception of money and power, but A, in the data, that's not necessarily true of Jews and any way money and power don't necessarily protect you or don't protect you from racism. But I'm really interested in your point about the woman you met at the wedding, right? And, and I thought about this. When I became a journalist, David, my, I, um, I remember saying to my grandmother, whom I mentioned right at the beginning, you know, the grandmother who had the typewriter, and I had this moment feeling like I was I was getting the chance to do the thing that she'd never been able to do, that had been, you know, uh, taken from her. And I remember going to her and saying, Granny, do you think I should, I was starting at the FT, I was becoming a reporter on the newsroom floor of the Financial Times, do you think I should go back to our old name? Because we were called Hershewitz in, right. in Berlin, in Germany. Should I go back and be James Hershewitz? And my grandmother said to me, no, darling, let's not wash our dirty linen in public. Right. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a, she, she was very, you know, very, very proud and very clear of her heritage. What, what was, what she was, was she was fearful. Yeah. She was fearful. And so That's I- That's so complex, James, when you say she's very proud and not to impugn your, your <laughs> grandparents, uh, but uh, the book is a critique of progressives. It is also a critique of Jews uh, yes. to some extent. And the way it's a critique of Jews is I'm saying to Jews, enough with the Jewish shame, right? Mm. Because I see that a lot. And actually I've seen it an awful lot. It's been very gratifying since the book came out. I've had lots of people writing to me on social media say 
I've always been embarrassed about being Jewish. I changed my name. I had a nose job. I've done all this stuff. I keep it under the carpet. I've read your book and I feel that's wrong. And I think that's good. And it's weird. I think possibly non-Jews don't realize how many Jews because oh. of fear and fear and shame are very complexly connected, feel that they can't tell people that they're Jewish. I mean, a, a, another strange example of that, I think, is, you know, I talk in the book a little bit about the casting of non-Jews uh, as Jews being not an issue uh, in many, many dramas or whatever, when now we reach we're at a time when generally, you know, you have to cast in line with the minority that's playing it. You have to have a disabled actor playing a disabled person and whatever, and that's all fine. Uh, I'm not going to get into the arguments of the rights and wrongs for that. I just say it's not the same for Jews. And then a few people said to me, well, you can't say that Jews are underrepresented in show business. And I can't say that, but I can say they've all had to change their names, haven't they? Kirk Douglas had to change his name. Even Woody Allen had to change his name from Stuart Allen Königsberg. And clearly what's going on there is, yes, these are talented people and they've done well, but to some extent that has involved hiding their Jewishness. And the, and the, and the point, I mean, the, the thing that you point out in the book, which I haven't clocked, of course, is that your Twitter handle underneath it, where not people boringly normally say, you know, the, all these views are my own, yours just says Jew. Yeah. And, you, and your thinking is that, and I love the fact that you say in the book, that's funny. Yeah. But you're also making a point, which is that most people will say a lot of other things before they say that, if at all. Yeah, they will. I mean, it's very... You know, people have asked me over many years why I say that and, it, you know, I don't always know my own motives and I would say my own motive primarily is it's funny. There's something funny about it. There's something funny as well as something very complicated and often used hatefully about the word. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a long section in the book about why it is that mm -hmm. that word is so complicated. The point I quote a bit from my book, The Secret Purposes, about when someone is trying to translate a Nazi using the word which she uses in English as Jewess, but realizes that's not hateful yeah. enough and translates it, retranslates it, translates it as Jew women, and then discovers this thing about that word, which is that you literally have to take the ish off and it becomes an insult. Mm -hmm. Jew wish boy, Jew boy, Jewish banker, Jew banker. I mean, it's incredible how the word changes in value, in moral value as you say it right and for me that demonstrates something very very deep about you know most minorities when they reclaim an insulting word which obviously we have seen the black community do and the gay community do and they've done it very successfully by saying we're going to own these bad words for jews it's a bit different because it's not slang it's not slang it's the actual word in the oed used to do i am a jew that is the real word and to reclaim it you have to use the exact word not the slang word right and uh, that's partly what i'm doing when i use the word jew I, i'm saying look at this word think about it so 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 i i want i want to i said at the beginning we'd bring as many people in and where i see we're already 20 odd minutes in and I, and I haven't done so i want to start doing that i want to if i can bring in nicola gore because one of the things that you also do in the book david which i also found myself going wow have we got that wrong is this question about black asian minority ethnic designation and the way in which companies do that society does that even government and i saw nicola i don't know nicola whether you're there and you're able to weigh in but i saw that you said in the hello nicola that you said that you had a problem about how you fill in diversity forms do, do, do you want to talk about that to david and tell us what you were thinking yeah hi david and um james yeah i've always done a double take whenever i get get to those forms and i get to the section and i put i, I go to put white every something inside me always says that doesn't quite describe it's not the totality of my identity and also i am many things but we are as david says we are we are invisible you know by not having a you know are we a race are we we are a, a member of bame so i've always tr been troubled by that and recently i've been studying psychotherapy and there's been 10 weeks of discussions around racism and the hierarchy of this racism debate and i'm no longer going to put white I just because it's not you know we we have we have we have white privilege in some ways those Jews who are what we have white skin but we're always othered we are an othered community so by making ourselves invisible it creates problems in the community itself and about how people see us and how we perceive ourselves so I really wondered whether this will change and you're well can i interrupt I, I completely agree with what you're saying i'm just going to add something 
which is I think those forms are not just about sort of, you know, demographics, they're about representation, right? And mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the census now, uh, it it's, tries very hard and it's really good to make sure that every type of other ethnicity is represented and feels recognized, feels witnessed within the census forms. So there are three different types or two different types of, uh, of black ethnicity, depending on whether you're Caribbean or out of African heritage. Uh, and then there's like three or four different types of Asian, different types of mixed race ones. Uh, there's Arab is on there. And I remember as a joke, I said, when I said this in an article that I thought possibly just through word association, when they're putting the census together, when they got to Arab, they might put Jew as the next one, but they don't, uh, it's not there. It's just British other. And the fact is that if these things are about representation as much as anything else, then obviously you feel a bit othered putting yourself in the word other. You don't feel witnessed by doing it, right? Uh, and in terms of the Bain thing, you know, my whole point in the book really is that Jews are an ethnic minority. They're not a religious minority, they're an ethnic minority. Most Jews are secular. They suffer racism, they suffer discrimination. Therefore, they need to be recognized under the category Bain. But I just say in the book, dear reader, you don't think we are, do you? you? You've never thought about it. And you probably, you might say, oh yeah, I guess so, but you've never thought about it. And we don't think about it in the way we classify things either. Uh, I think in the book, I point to a few examples of, you know, Sajid Javid being hailed as the first BAME chancellor when, you know, Nigel Lawson was the first BAME chancellor, as far as I'm concerned, um, and so on and so forth. And it actually is an active issue now with COVID because, you know, you've got this thing, which is a problem whereby various BAME communities are not taking up vaccinations and having more problems with COVID transmission. So is the Jewish community, certainly the Orthodox Jewish community particularly, but there are no videos reaching out to them. There just aren't in those BAME videos. So, and David, Nicola, thank you. It, it's interesting. I see that Sudi Piggott's made the point that was actually on my mind a few weeks ago when I went for a PCR test and you had to fill out the form and you thought, oh, that's strange. I remember thinking just that's strange that it's, there's not a, there, there, there's not a Jewish box. And I remember wondering to myself whether it's because statistically there are so few Jews in the UK that, that it doesn't somehow warrant I don't know whether you've looked into this, David, what the reason is. Yes, no, I, do know, I know what the reason is, because I wrote about it. And the reason is that uh, the census feels, because it, Jewish is in the uh, religious section. There's a, there's a different section further on in the census, which is what religion are you? And Jewish is in that, right? Uh, but I have a problem with that because I'm an atheist. I, I can't, it says, what faith do you follow? Right? So I can't put Jewish there. I absolutely don't follow the Jewish faith. I don't, I'm not, I don't believe in Judaism. Uh, and many, many other Jews would agree with that. And I don't feel it. And this is all about, to some extent, self-identification, to coin a phrase. And, you know, I am not, it doesn't do anything for me. Uh, and also, it don't, I don't think it does anything for Jews, as I say, to reiterate this idea that they are primarily religiously defined. Because at the end of the day, what are these census things about? They're about trying to eradicate racism. And as I say, the racists aren't interested in whether or not you're a religion. They're only, they think about blood. They think about whether you had Jewish parents and whether you've got a Jewish name. And those things apply whatever your religious beliefs. So it should be in the ethnicity section. So, and can I just understand one thing, David? When I read the book and you make the argument that, you know, Jews are not counted as part of the black Asian minority ethnic, just explain this term by Bay, black Asian ethnic, minority ethnic. Are you making the point that this is an example of how quote unquote Jews don't count? Or are you actually saying, no, I think that when people count their diversity in companies or public institutions, they should count Jews under minority ethnic, that that should go to part of their diversity quote unquote. Well, that's complicated. So I get this a lot uh, since the books come out and yeah, the books kind of cut through, which I'm very pleased about, but it means that I get some weird questions, including sort of people ringing me up from, you know, organisations saying, oh, do you think that we should now make sure that we include Jew Jewish Jews in this, that and the other? And I, what I do think is that anti-Semitism should be included in racist aware awareness raising consciousness, racist stuff that, you know, happens a lot in uh industries and in businesses now that people have to go on various courses to understand how they might be implicitly or unconsciously racist a lot of people have written to me to say oh i just did a sort of seven hour one of those and no one mentioned anti-semitism and i do definitely think that that should be included however in general the book is not a piece of social planning 
It's not a roadmap. It's not a manifesto. It's an analysis of how I feel things are uh, in a it, within terms of the progressive discourse and the way that the progressive agenda drives the wider uh, discussion and conversation so, so, about how we view so, so minorities. Right. And it's not really so, saying, so therefore we should do this, that or the other. I don't really know the answers to that. I'm just raising the awareness. Right. So you're saying the fact that, they, that the Jews are not counted as quote unquote minority ethnic is a measure of how Jews don't count. It's yeah. not necessarily your argument that you should start counting them in diversity statistics. Uh, I guess so. I mean, you know, I, 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 I don't want to say yes to that because I know that if I had looked at the census and under ethnicity after Arab, it had said Jewish, I would have felt, oh, that's good. I thought that's good. You know, so right. I'm not, so I don't know if I agree with what your characterization just now. I'm just saying that for myself, I'm a commentator and a comedian and I'm like using those skills and my and analytical skills to say, here's the road, here's the landscape. And I don't know, yes. I don't want to map anything onto it specifically, but yes, if you want to take away from that, maybe Jews should be more included uh, when you do your BAME statistics or when you make your censuses, then I do think that. Okay. David, thank you. I, I'm not, mine's not even a characterization. I think I'm looking to you to think, okay, can you, can you figure us out? Can you navigate us through that set of problems? Oh, and they're clearly, they're, they're clearly difficult. Let, I wanted, if I might, just go to Victoria Hart. Uh, th this goes back to a point you made earlier on, Dave, which is really interesting about how Jews identify in public. One of the themes in the book is sort of even the way in which the Jewish Chronicle addresses anti-Semitism and does or doesn't make a you know, forceful fuss about it. V Victoria, you made this point about, you know, when you started out at work, not being particularly, you know, well, just, why don't you make, you make the point, you'll make it better than I do. Yeah, I mean, so I'm a social worker. I was working in social work uh, many, many years and I never raised the fact that I was Jewish because it just, just never came up wasn't something I feel particular. I mean, I grew up obvious. Well, I say obviously, it's not at all obvious. I could have grown up in any situation, but you know, I was raised Jewish, went to Jewish schools, but it just never. I'm not religious, and it never came up. And it, I came back, and I was a big open plan office social worker. Somebody came back and was talking about a Jewish woman that they'd visited in, and was. I'm getting a bit emotional thinking about it because there was no doubt that it was extremely explicitly racist, anti-Semitic, no doubt. And what did they say, Victoria? Um, just about have not not being entitled to any services because they're hiding all their wealth. Really? Yeah. So this is somebody who's accessing social care. You know, they they have all the money. They 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 you know they, she must be hiding her money because she's trying to con us into providing service. Older woman, you know. And I was really you know yeah my jaw was dropping. And no, uh, but the thing that, and I did raise I raised it with my manager. And it got addressed, but the fact that I didn't come back immediately to it because it was shocked me so much, and the fact that nobody else in the room spoke up, and this is a, an area, a field of work that I would have expected, you know, somebody to raise something. Um, I'm I'm way past that job now. I mean, that must have been about ten years ago. And to be honest, since then, I've just been really explicitly telling people. <laughs> And actually, the experience over the last couple of years has made me even more um, expressive about, you know, there's no doubt in anyone's mind that I work with that I'm Jewish. But, there's, there's something yeah. about that, Victoria, if I could pick up on it, uh, which I think is really important. And I mentioned this in the book. Uh, well, there's a story I, I don't tell in the book, uh, which that reminds me of, which is my brother said he was, and I don't think the guy knew he was Jewish, but he was looking at a flat somewhere and he my brother was looking at this flat actually he knew himself he probably couldn't afford it because it was too expensive but the estate agent showing him round the flat said yeah I'd buy a flat here myself if I was more Jewish meaning okay. if I was richer right and it's that kind of ex extraordinary you know very very casual anti-semitism that you do get all the time but here's the thing about it and I talk about this in the book is I think that there is a weird thing that I do say in the book, all racisms are not the same and Jews have a specific racism and the one is that they are powerful and rich. And I think some people, when they essentially say, well, Jews are rich, they sort of don't think that's an insult or mm -hmm. racist. They just think, well, being rich is a good thing, isn't it? So it's all right to characterize Jews as rich. But unfortunately what that misses out is that calling Jews rich inspires 
envy and hatred and a sense that Jews have got ill-gotten gains and that they are in league together to keep their money. And also it's never just about them being rich. It's about them being, as you said, miserly and grasping and hiding their money and whatever. It's always got very, very extreme and uh, bad add-ons, that idea of Jews being rich. But I do think I see it. I see like that person who you said just came back to social services, a place where people are supposed to be very aware and just said, oh, it's a Jewish woman, but we don't need to give her any help because she's definitely hiding her money because she's Jewish. I mean, you just think like that's breathtaking. And yet at some level, that person won't have seen that they're being racist. David, can I ask a question? And I noticed that, you know, Sally Young's asked this too. And I suppose it's implicit in, um, uh, you know, in, in the point that you were just making, which is whether or not you're seeing a real increase in anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism, and if so, why? And just to give you some context for it, you know, I've been a journalist for, you know, 25 plus years now, and, and certainly for the first couple of decades, I remember thinking, well, this is an anti-Semitism hasn't really touched me. It was actually only when I went, started the BBC, and I went, I remember I had to go and give a talk at the British Library, and there was a man who stood up at the at the back who asked a question and the question was did I think that given my ethnic identity I was fit to run a newsroom right. and I remember being just flabbergasted by it not just because of the nature of the question but also that it was my first real encounter of that in the media and I wonder whether you think that, it, that something's actually happening in terms of trends around racism including anti-semitism um, or whether or whether something specific is happening around anti-Semitism? Well, so that's a, there's two answers to that. I mean, one, one is I think that, um, you know, I, I, I have experienced, I think, quite a lot of anti-Semitism. Some of it is straightforward and some of it is more implicit, I think. And once I became someone who was well known, you know, I became more aware of that kind of insidious stuff that would be quite hard and slippery to pin down. And just sometimes, and this is difficult to say sometimes because you something is this just special pleading? But sometimes you'd read something about yourself in the press and you think, okay, there seems to be another agenda going on here. Sort of a really weird sort of like hatred of me that is maybe they just hate me, these people, but they seem to really viscerally hate me. And maybe that's something else going on. But in terms of now, rather than my entire career, I mean, I, this is not an original thing to say, but it simply is the case that uh, anti-Semitism is massively on the rise. I mean, across Europe and in America. And a lot of that is actually not from, as I say, straightforwardly, well, some of it is from the left, actually, uh, because of the very complicated interplay of the left uh, with, you know, we haven't talked about this, but obviously with anti-Zionism and all the rest of it. Uh, but also, obviously, social media. It's just like, it's one of the most extraordinary and depressing the predictable things that when society creates a mechanism to spread ideas much, much more quickly than we've ever been able to do before, the ideas that have stuck with us for so many years that the Jews are somehow at the heart of all bad things, they spread faster as well. I once saw an American stand-up begin his set. I mean, I, this was a funny thing to do. I'm not being nasty about him. I thought it was really funny. He started by saying, I blame the Jews. It's quicker that way. And it's a funny joke, but that is the internet to some extent. I mean, that's a mischaracterization, but there are large sections of the internet that mm. are extraordinarily able to discover that the Jews are somehow responsible for all evil. David, I, I want to, um, if I can bring in Benjamin Cohen, because one of the things that you touch on in the book is the trolling of you and the attempt to negate you um, as a commentator on anti-Semitism and racism more broadly. And, and Benjamin wrote an interesting point in the chat. Um, Benjamin, I think you wrote that you said that you're the editor of Pink News, is that right? I'm not the editor, I'm the CEO and the founder. CEO. Uh, yeah, and like, like if, you, if you're running a LGBT media company that's the biggest in the world and you happen to be Jewish, that's not particularly good because they basically want to believe that uh, the Jews obviously are controlling the media, and in this case, we're controlling the LGBT media. And what I have, get all the time, I get huge levels of anti of homophobia sent to me first, or transphobia, depending on the story. But then within about 10 minutes, it, they like various different bots or whatever picks up the debate, and it then switches to, to anti-Semitism. So I got one example that was really quite horrific a couple of years ago. I posted a picture with my nieces, who then I think were four and two, 
we were reading a book which was called Prince and Prince. It was an LGBT inclusive children's book. But the message was just so vile. So it started obviously like, I'm a paedophile, I'm trying to make my nieces become lesbian or something. But then it became anti-Semitic. They were taking out pictures and like using them on, putting us into like Auschwitz and using the yellow star and things like that. It's just quite horrific. They also believe this quite seriously that there is a, a conspiracy theory going on. Well, there's a conspiracy, Jewish conspiracy to turn the world LGBT and in particular to turn women to be trans men and for men to become uh, trans women. That's like their, their current like belief. So their belief that because the LGBT movement and I suppose Pink News believe in reform to the Gender Recognition Act, that that is part of our, my Jewish conspiracy to just ruin the whole world. And right. it's just a constant thing. And there's nothing done, nothing is done well enough on this to try and deal with the moderation or any of the other issues. Can I, can I add to that, Benjamin? Um, you know about this, but I don't know how many people here do, something called the Great Replacement uh, Conspiracy Theory. So when I first saw uh, those white supremacists in Charlottesville chanting, the Jews will not replace us, you may be aware of that, uh, I thought, what, what are they talking about? Uh, what do they mean? And what they actually mean is this theory that, uh, which is similar in a way to what you're talking about, which is that immigration of uh, black and brown people, uh, which obviously white supremacists hate, is not just a thing that's happening, it's being masterminded by the Jews. And that the Jews who themselves are obviously not part of the white races, as far as white supremacists are concerned, are for their own nefarious purposes you know, controlling mass immigration, uh, sort of promoting multiculturalism in order to undermine the white races. And this has very, very serious implications. The guy who killed 11 Jews in Pittsburgh in 2018, that's why he did it. And that, by the way, is an interesting, ter obviously terrible thing, but interesting because I think people get confused about that. I saw Jenny Tong, who is a, you know, used to be a Liberal Dem MP, post a Facebook thing about how, oh, you know, does anyone, this is terrible, but this is the kind of thing that happens when Israel does what it does. And you think like, it's really nothing to do with Israel. It's a white supremacist who thinks Jews are gonna take over the world and are doing it through, you know, uh, promoting multiculturalism. And I, I'm not aware of what Benjamin's talking about as much, but it really doesn't surprise me. It really does not surprise me that another arm uh, would be okay, well, clearly the uh, gay agenda and the trans agenda and trying to make people, you know, accept those communities, uh, which obviously those people will also hate, is also being masterminded by the Jews because of this weird thing uh, that, that they find, they have to find a, a narrative of responsibility for things that are just happening because the world is changing. And for some reason that always comes down to the notion of the controlling Jew. David, thank you. It's really interesting. I want to, I want to, if I might, just bring in Anna Winger at this stage. Um, I don't know, people may or may not have seen uh, Anna Winger's amazing television series, Unorthodox. And I wondered, Anna, in your writing and producing of Unorthodox, you know, what you experienced of this? Well, you know, the, listen, there's a, the spectrum of Jewish experience is very broad. And obviously my life is at one end of it and uh, Deborah Feldman's life is at the other. And I think that we, we got into a very rich conversation about um, Jewishness because we made, we made a decision from the beginning that we would only cast Jewish actors. I put that in the chat because it was, and if people were really shocked by that at the beginning, it was as if we had taken a sort of offensively political position where right. it seems so natural to us, especially as we were shooting in Germany where there's a tradition of making movies and, and television that relate to Jewish history where there's no Jews on either side of the camera involved, right? So we said, well, we, won't, we will only cast Jewish actors and we had to look really far and wide for the actors. So I think we, you know, we got in a big conversation about that, but I will say something about visibility. I, there's David, someday I'm gonna meet you in person because I found your book really fascinating and there's a lot, it's, it's made me think about many things, Thank but you. the thing about visibility and passing, it, you know, it's, I thought about it a lot when thinking about religious, about the Orthodox, because you know, they're taking it for the team and yeah. it is, that is something that's, it's real. You know, when you spend a lot of time 
interviewing people, working with, I worked with a lot of ex Hasidic uh, actors on the show. And, you know, when you dress like that and in, and part of their commitment to their faith is that they will always be visible and that they will not try to assimilate and that you know, there's something moving about it because they believe that if they're so committed to this, that they, if they never try to assimilate that the Holocaust won't happen again. And it's the logic of that might seem flawed, but it's, it's really painful. And when I think about, you know, I, I'm American, but I've spent a lot of time in England and it, it is true that people don't talk openly about being Jewish compared to New York, where I come from. It's, it is a different Culture, way yeah. of being Jewish. Often people tell me they're Jewish, like with unorthodox, it's been funny how many people say, well, you know, I'm actually Jewish right. to me. And I, I, people I've known for ages, they never mentioned it. You know, I've never heard them do anything related to the holidays or whatever. But um, yeah, so I, I, I was wondering if you think I, sorry, now I've lost. I no, lost Anna, can I say I something said, though? Yeah. I really like your show. It's really great. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the primary thing I want to say, Unorthodox is really great. Uh, but I also wanted to raise something about the depiction of Jews, uh, which is so my book was reviewed in uh, the Sunday Times by pretty well by Dominic Lawson. The picture they used was a picture of an Orthodox Jew coming out of a deli. And quite a few people said to me, and I basically agree with them, that's a slightly weird choice, isn't it? Because the book very, very clearly states this is not a book about religion. Uh, it's a book about me as an atheist Jew and about the ethnicity of Jews. And yet clearly the picture editor thought, mm, it's a book about Jews. We have to illustrate Jewishness somehow. So we'll go for the big hat and the beard and whatever. And I think, I mean, I don't really necessarily think that's problematic, but I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting because, um, so Unorthodox and Steisel, right, both of them are brilliant shows. And I, so don't take this as a criticism, Anna. It's a brilliant show. But I'm going to say that I don't think it would be easy to commission presently a show about Jews that wasn't about Orthodox Jews. Oh, I've got all kinds of things going. You're wrong about that. You're right, well, okay, I'm wrong about it. So what have you got? I'm making a show right now that's um, about the refugee crisis in Marseille in 1940. Right. Uh, it's a very Jewish story. It's like a Jewish adventure story. It's amazing and awesome. And everybody's Jewish, practically, if they're not blacklisted artists. Um, yeah, I sorry, I didn't really mean, it wasn't really including like historical but, but, stuff. But that actually has to do with the Holocaust. So in a fact, yeah, in a way, you're right. Holocaust stuff. I'm working, I'm writing a show, another project, that's set in apartheid South Africa, and it deals a lot with Jewishness. Okay. In fact, James, I, 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 I next to your I, mother at a dinner. My, my point, like, which is obviously wrong, so that's fine. Uh, but my point is, I think that sometimes within the identity politics landscape that we live in, in Britain, sort of opening of like, okay, well, we'll we'll consider Jews as long as they're obviously very different. Mm -hmm. That then, then then we can talk about them, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think that's. Yeah. And I think that the, the difficulty for progressives that when they think about Jews is, as I say this in the book, is that people like me, not different enough, not different enough to be considered an ethnicity. I'm talking about now white cis het progressives. I'm talking about straight white cis het progressives who make the decision, these are the minorities I'm going to be concerned about. And I say this in the book, that I think they think Jews... They're just not different enough. They're basically me. They're basically just a version of me, right? Blah, blah, blah. And I think sometimes the Orthodox Jews are given a slightly different arena within that. Anna, I'm going to stop this, although I have to say the thing that's really exciting is you should be watching the chat. Lots of people saying, well, I'm looking forward to that TV series. I'm looking forward to that show. Um, I, I, I'm doing, I'm doing a, a, a lousy job of tr keeping the time or even on track. I, I see that Daphne Rose made this interesting point about Jews of colour and how we, and the issue about whiteness, Jewishness and colour. And Daphne, I just wonder whether you wanted to put that point to uh, David. Are you are you muted? Let me see if I can. Sorry, sorry, Daphne. I think. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Yeah, you're free. Yeah, to speak. Yeah, William. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think we tend to focus a lot on the Ashkenazi story. As as Westerners, we tend to think about the diaspora, and we think of only the Ashkenazi Jews, so the Jews that were exiled into Europe, which the majority of us who are here today are. I happen to be half Sephardic as well, but we don't. I think Jews are going through an identity crisis. I don't think that we even understand just how diverse we are. 
And I think the zeitgeist plays a massive role in this as well, because we tend to, whatever the zeitgeist says is righteous at the time, Jews are always painted as the antithesis of that. So at the moment, the zeitgeist focuses a lot on colonialism, on imperialism. And so therefore Jews are now being painted as white people who are stealing brown people's land. Instead of people understanding the rich history of Jews and how we've always had we don't have to get into Israel, Palestine, it's, it's not about that, but it's understanding that we are so diverse and that the majority of Jews actually in the world are Jews of color and that mm -hmm. we only focus on the Ashkenazi story. And I think it would be great to hear more Mizrahi stories, Sephardic stories, Beta Jew stories. And I'd love to see more of that out there. So I'm just curious to know what you yeah. think about trying to get that out there. Yeah, no, I, I agree with it uh, completely. Uh, I mean, I think it's a flaw in the book that I don't talk enough about Jews of colour, which is quite a big flaw, considering that my niece is a, is a person of colour uh, and Jewish. Uh, but I think partly that's because of my theory, which not everyone would subscribe to, that I see all Jews as kind of non-white. And obviously there are degrees of that. As I say, my, my niece is mixed race and there's Sephardi Jews and there's obviously Arabic Jews and Iraqi and all that kind of stuff. And so that would, you know, the scales of that are very complex indeed. But I am trying to make a point in the book that I feel that the kind of standard progressive attitude, and obviously there are lots of people who don't think this either, but is that Jews are essentially a branch of whiteness. And that is one reason why they get somewhat discounted in the way that you know the protections that are offered to other minorities are not available to Jews. And uh, so what I would say possibly that uh, in terms of Jews of color is that I think they definitely need to hear more of their stories, but that sometimes uh, there might be a sense in which a pro you know I'm completely setting up a straw man or woman here, but which in a, if a progressive is sort of happy to talk about a person of color who happens to be Jewish, my niece, for example, I, I would be saying, right, are you, are you sort of allowing them into this conversation about ethnicity and discrimination or whatever because they're of colour or because they're Jewish? Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can, I, can I, David, Daphne, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm really aware that I've done like a spectacularly lousy job of trying to keep to time, not least because I, I realise we come towards this last five minutes and I might indulge people just to give us a couple minutes more if you, and if you've got it, David, because they're two big issues that I feel we haven't really talked about. One is Israel and the other is labor, right? And, and let's start with labor because you get to the end of the book and it's almost as if you're, you're handing in the manuscript and the EHRC report yeah. comes in yeah. and just carpets Corbyn for anti-Semitism and the position of the Labour Party. And I just wanted to hear what you think happened within, for Corbyn personally and within labor. Um, well... Yeah, I wrote a coda, which was literally the day that I thought I finished with this book now. And then, uh, yeah, the EHRC report came out and Corbyn was suspended and the shit hit the fan. Um, and I, I think the, the thing I most want to say about that, uh, which I do say in the book, is that there was a huge political fuss about that. You know, and, you know, people from the left started immediately saying because Keir Starmer accepted the re results of the ERHC report and suspended Corbyn, that it was an attempt to purge the left and blah, blah, blah. And the point I make in the book is this, is that some people might say to me, well, clearly Jews count. Look at this enormous fuss. And what I want to say is it's a big political fuss. It's not a people fuss. No one's lives and the effect of racism on their lives and the anxiety of the last five years is being talked about here. It's immediately what it always seems to be for the left, which is a political bifurcation. And you've got this ridiculous situation now. It's completely ridiculous for me as someone who grew up in a very left-wing household and my Jewishness, if anything, was associated with that, that anti-antisemitism, being concerned about antisemitism, is now positioned as something, as it were, owned by the right. So that yeah, when yeah. Keir Starmer says, I want to stand with the Jewish community, I see people on Twitter saying, this is an attack on the left. And you mm -hmm. think like, I'm sorry, I thought it was an anti-racist statement. But, but, yeah. there's a, but there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that that you touch on in the book, Dave, which is the relationship between anti-capitalism and anti-Semitism and the extent to which for Corbyn, at least the way I, I read it, was you saying he was he's so determined to, you know, to, to protect the position of people who are taking a strongly anti-capitalist stance that he's willing to, if you like, you know, sort of, you know, not get too het up about you know, anti-Semitism and hence the mural. And I wondered whether or not you think that that is the tension at the heart of the left. 
Yeah, I, I would say it is. I, and I, th I think it's very, very complicated. And I don't know about not getting het up. I don't, in my book, it's often just not seeing it at all. Yes. So I think with the mural, I would say Mir One, who did that mural and who, you know, is very ostensibly woke, for want of a better word, and progressive, you know, was just furious with what he called hashtag Rothschild and hashtag Warburg. People worried, the white Jewish folk worried about their beloved hashtag, but, but hashtag Rothschild, whatever. Uh, and then Corbyn seeing that mural and just saying, oh, yeah, yeah, on his Facebook page, I remember similar thing happened to Diego Rivera or whatever. It's all references point of the left towards this aesthetic of anti-capitalism of murals, of images of anti-capitalism. And unfortunately for those people, there is a long tradition of anti-capitalism being imaged as yes. essentially anti-Semitism. Uh, and sometimes not even consciously, but how do we imagine the villain? How do we imagine the fat scheming capitalist? It is always dark, hook-nosed, swarthy, counting his money, often bearded, you know, and that goes back to a Christian aesthetic, like much longer embedded in our culture than that of the Labour Party or whatever, but often, there just is no difference between the way those things are imagined. But the, 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 the one interesting thing I also point out that you do flag up, and I hadn't thought of this, which is it's not Rothschild and Warburg, it's hashtag Rothschild yeah. and hashtag Warburg, because there's a way of flagging those people up and, and driving an inquiry in social media that takes you to a certain place. I thought that was really... Never forget the internet. That's what Mir One did. He posted on his Facebook page that statement, and he put hashtag Rothschild and hashtag Warburg. If you click on those hashtags, you go straight to the vilest conspiracy theory. So mm -hmm. I just don't know how Mir One, who's, a, as I say, a very progressive person in his own mind, doesn't really know what he's doing there. So, so, so this is so, ridiculously, it's 7.30, but I wanna pick up, I want if you will indulge us for a couple more minutes, David. The, the, one, of the, one of the areas in which I think you, you might let yourself or at least other Jews off the hook is that you say, look, AI, you're an atheist, right? That's one thing, and that makes, but also you're not a Zionist, right? And, and for many people, this argument actually really comes to life around the arguments of, over Israel, right? Not about Netanyahu, not about the conduct of the Israeli give, government, but the existence of the state of Israel. And your, your view is, in the book, I think your word is meh, you know, yeah. it doesn't bother you, right? Mm -hmm. But for those people for whom it really does matter, for those people for whom the state of Israel is, is part of an expression of the Jewish experience, they would argue that some of the anti-Zionism, anti-Zionism is itself just a cover for anti-Semitism. In fact, might even be a form of anti-Semitism. You, you don't get into that. And that is clearly an issue amongst progressives and on the left. It is, but I, to some extent, uh, uh, you know, I get into trouble with some Jews for saying this, but I tend to refer to Israel as stupid fucking Israel, by which I don't mean necessarily a comment on the country. I mean, a comment on the enormous and idiotic baggage that surrounds any discussion of that country. And in a small book, I just thought I'm not getting into a long debate, which in itself is weighed down by intense racism about anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, partly because it is my contention in the book that uh, the fact that Jews have to navigate that baggage, have to sort of say exactly where they are positioned in the difficult and nuanced debate about Israel and Zionism and that's anti-Semitism, whatever, is itself racist because I and any other Jew should be allowed to say what I think about anti-Semitism and say, I think this is anti-Semitic. I think the Labour Party in that time did some anti-Semitic things without saying, oh, by the way, don't worry. I don't, I'm not a Zionist. I don't, I'm not a shill. I'm not paid by Mossad. Right? I shouldn't have to say those things. And the notion that I should have to say them is racist. And I, so my shortness of the chapter about Israel and the kind of meh about it is a statement about that, really. It's a statement about saying, I refuse mm -hmm. to outline a very complex and difficult position on Israel so that you, the progressive, are reassured that I'm not a Zionist and speaking with that agenda. But, but what do you say to those people who say, actually, that anti-Zionism is itself a form of anti-Semitism? <laughs> Uh, I don't really agree with that, but because I think it's entirely on the context. So mm -hmm. I believe it. So, for example, right, and so many people here, pro, Jews here will not agree with this, but I'll, it's more or less what I think. I don't really get into this in the book, as I say, but I believe that, for example, uh, it is not necessarily anti-Semitic to say that the state of Israel has no right to exist. It, 
from a Palestinian point of view or a very strong supporter of Palestinians, that is a political position. It's not my political position, but it's not necessarily anti-Semitic in my opinion. It's anti-Semitic, which happens all the time, when that position is allied to and enhanced by anti-Semitic tropes. So the minute that you start saying, as certain people do all the time, uh, it's, uh, it, it has no right to exist and it only exists because it's propped up by government lobbying and secret lobbying and power and privilege and money and blah, 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 and control of the press, then it becomes anti-Semitic within seconds. And the blurring of those two happens all the time. D David, thank you. As you can tell, we, as if, you, if you've been following in the chat, which you probably haven't because you've been concentrating on what you're saying, the, there's been this wave of people saying, this is the great start of a conversation. We yeah. want to have more and talk more. I, sh I should also say that what you said at the beginning was not unreasonable. It is not only brilliant, but it's also a short book. Yeah. Uh, for some people who thought, well, this was a good conversation, I could also say to you, you could have spent a very fruitful hour and probably got most of the way through it. So uh, do take the chance to read it. Um, I, I know that um, uh, there are many people who had points of view. Um, I really appreciate uh, the extent to which people shared them and as openly as candidly. Um, thank you all for your time. I know everyone zoomed out, so I really appreciate you joining us. But most of all, a big thank you to you, David, because I haven't written the book. It's most thank you everyone for listening, by the way, and for all your contributions. They're all really valuable. Made me think about stuff, which is always good. So thank you very much. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thanks, everybody. Thank